Hi friends, welcome back to Flat Fire and Friends Tuesday. Um, this week we are going to read chapter four of Flat Stanley. I'm super excited. We're almost towards the end, which is crazy. Um, I am outside and it's a little windy out, so I hope you can still hear me. And in my neighborhood I do have a few dogs, so they might bark a little bit, but they're not going to come over. They're not scary. They're actually very friendly. They just like to let their friends know that they're outside when they bark. Um, so just to recap, chapter one, Stanley became flat. Chapter two, he went on an adventure to help his mom find the ring in the sewer. Um, and then he was flown by the mail um, to his friend in California. And then chapter three, he went on an adventure as a kite for his brother, which is so cool. Um, so chapter four is called The Museum Thieves, and I just want to show you this picture before I start reading. Just remember, I read, and then I turn the pictures just because it's easier and it's a chapter book. Um, so here's the picture for the page. All right. Chapter four, The Museum Thieves. Mr. and Mrs. O.J. Dart lived in the apartment above the lamb chops. Mr. Dart was an important man, the director of a famous art, famous, Museum of Art downtown in the city. Stanley Lambchop had noticed in the elevator that Mr. Dart, who was ordinarily a cheerful man, had become quite gloomy, but he had no idea what the reason was. And then at breakfast one morning, he heard Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop talking about Mr. Dart. I see, said Mr. Lambchop, reading the paper over his cup of coffee. That's still another painting has been stolen from the famous museum. It says here that Mr. Mr. O.J. Dart, the director, is at his wit's end. Oh dear, are the police no help, Mrs. Lambchop asked. It seems not, said Mr. Lambchop. Listen to what the chief of police told the newspaper. We suspect a gang of sneak thieves. These are the worst kind. They work by sneakery, which makes them very difficult to catch. However, my men and I will keep trying. Meanwhile, I hope people will buy tickets for the policeman's ball and not park their cars where signs don't say. The next morning, Stanley Lambchop heard Mr. Dart talking to his wife in the elevator. These sneak thieves work at night, Mr. Dart said. It is very hard for our guards to stay awake when they have been on duty all day. And the famous museum is so big, we cannot guard every picture at the same time. I fear it is hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. Suddenly, as if an electric light bulb had lit up in the air above his head, giving out little shooting lines of excitement, Stanley Lambchop had an idea. He told it to Mr. Dart. So the page that I'm going to read is all about this picture right here, but I'll show it once and then I can show it again after too. Stanley, Mr. Dart said, if your mother will give her permission, I will put you and your plan to work this is this very night. Ooh, I wonder what plan is. Mrs. Lambchop gave her permission, but you'll have to take a long nap this afternoon, she said. I won't have you up all hours unless you do. That evening, after a long nap, Stanley went, to, went with Mr. Dart to the famous museum. Mr. Dart took him into the main hall where the biggest and most important paintings were hung. He pointed to a huge painting that showed a bearded man wearing a floppy velvet hat playing a violin for a lady who lay on the couch. There was a half man, half horse person standing behind them and three fat children with wings, with wings were flying around. That, Mr. Dart explained, was the most expensive painting in the world. There was an empty picture frame on the opposite wall. We shall hear more about that later on. Mr. Dart took Stanley into his office and said, It is time for you for you to put on your disguise. I already thought of that, Stanley Lamtrop said, and I brought one, my cowboy suit. It has a red bandana that I can tie over my face. No one will recognize me in a million years. No, Mr. Dart said. You will have to wear the disguise I have chosen. From a closet, he took a white dress, a blue sash, and a pair of shiny little painted shoes. A wide straw hat with a blue band that matched the sash, and a wig and a stick. The wig was made of blonde hair, long, done in, right, done in ringlets. Sorry. 
The stick was curved at the top and it too had a blue ribbon on it. In this shepherdess disguise, Mr. Dart said, you will look like a painting that belongs in the main hall. We do not have a cowboy pictures in the main hall. Sammy was so disgusted he could hardly speak. I will look like a girl. That's what I will look like, he said. I wish I, I wish I had never had my idea. But he was a good sport, so he put on the disguise. Back in the main hall, Mr. Dart helped Stanley climb into the empty picture frame. Stanley was able to stay in place because Mr. Dart had cleverly put four small spikes in the wall, one for each hand and foot. The frame was a perfect fit against the wall. Stanley looked just like a picture, except for one thing, Mr. Dart said. Shepherdess are supposed to look happy. They smile at their sheep and at the sky. You look fierce, not happy, Stanley. Hmm. It is a boy, but he's doing the right thing, right? So, let's see. Stanley tried hard to get a faraway look in his eyes and even to smile a little bit. Mr. Dark, Mr. Dart stood back a few feet and stared at him for a moment. Well, he said, it may not be art, but I know what I like. He went off to make sure that certain other parts of Stanley's plan were taken care of and Stanley was left alone. It was very dark in the main hall. A little bit of light came through the windows and Stanley could just make out the world's most expensive painting on the opposite wall. He felt as though the bearded man with the violin and the lady on the couch had the half and the half horse person and the winged children were all waiting as he was for something to happen. Time passed and he got tired er and tired er. Anyone would be tired this late at night, especially if he had to stand in a picture frame balancing on little spikes. Maybe they won't come, Stanley thought. Maybe the sneak thieves won't come at all. The moon went behind a cloud, and then the main hall was pitch dark. It seemed to get quieter, too, with the darkness. There was absolutely no sound at all. Stanley felt the hair on the back of his neck prickle beneath the golden curls of the wig. Sorry about the background noise. Creak. The creaking sound came right from out in the middle of the main hall. And even as he heard it, Stanley saw it in the same place the tiny yellow glow of light. The creaking came again, and the glow got bigger. A trap door had opened in the floor, and two men came up through into the hall. Stanley understood everything all at once. These must be the sneak thieves. They had a secret trap door entrance into the museum from outside. That's why they had never been caught. And now, tonight, they were back to steal the most expensive painting in the world. He held very still in the picture frame and listened to the sneak thieves. This is it, Max, said the first one. This is where we art robbers pull a sensational job. Well, the civilized community sleeps. Right, Luther, said the other man. In, this, in all this great city, there is no one to suspect us. Ha, 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 that Stanley Lamb Shop. That's what you think. The sneak thieves put down their lantern and took the world's most expensive painting off the wall. What would we do to anyone who tried to capture us, Max? The first man asked. We would hurt them. What else? His friend replied. That was enough to frighten Stanley, and he was even more frightened. see. Luther came over and stared at him. This sheep girl, Luther said. I thought sheep girls were supposed to smile, Max. This one looked scared. Just in time, Stanley managed to get a far away look in his eyes again and to smile, sort of. You're crazy, Luther, Max said. She's smiling. And what a pretty little thing she is, too. That made Stanley ferocious. He waited until the sneak thieves had turned their back to the world's most expensive painting, and he shouted in the loudest, most terrifying voice, Police! Police! Mr. Dart, the sneak thieves are here! Oh, sorry, hold on. <laughs> the sneak thieves looked at each other. Max said the first one very quietly. I think I heard the sheep girl yell. I think I did too, said Max in a quivery voice. Oh boy, yelling pictures, we both need a rest. 
You'll get a rest all right, shouted Mr. Dart, rushing in with the chief of police and lots of guards and the policemen behind him. You'll get arrested, that's what. Ha ha ha. The sneak thieves were too mixed up by Mr. Dart's joke and too framed by the policemen to put up a fight. Before they knew it, they had handcuffed, they had been handcuffed and led away to jail. The next, sorry, hold on. <laughs> the next morning in the office of the chief of police, Stanley Lamchop, got a medal. The day after that, his picture was in the newspaper. All right, that is it for chapter four today. And then next week we have chapter five, which is Arthur's good idea. So here's a little sneak peek. So I wonder what's gonna happen. That was good. I'm glad Stanley helped catch those thieves um, in the museum. Just a reminder to keep sending in all those flat ferret um, pictures and show us your adventure with him. We love it. And shout out to Mary Lou for all of the amazing work you've done visiting people. And, and each one by one giving him some clothing or coloring him. That is a super cool idea. And I love it. Um, so yeah, keep sending in those flat ferrets or friends. See, we're here with all our friends because we love to hang out and read. Um, and keep watching because I think we have some amazing people coming up um, to show us what they've been doing with Flat Parrot. Um, some surprises we'll see in the next few weeks. All right, guys, thanks for listening, and I'll see you guys later. Bye. What's up, everybody? Um, so I'm just taking a stroll through my neighborhood right now, um, but you might be asking, with who? Um, let me tell you, none other than my friend, Flat Ferret. That's right. Flat Ferret's been keeping me company lately. You know, I've been missing um, all my friends who I can't see right now. But luckily, I've had Flat Ferret here. We've done tons of stuff together. We've been going on walks, like right now. We've been doing puzzles. We've been baking cookies. We've been going to online class together, you know? All that fun stuff that we get to do while we're here. So... I'm really happy to have my friend here. Hey everybody, we're back at the town hall. And Freddie and I, we're going into the Comptroller's to visit Frances. See, she can do a little something pretty to make Freddie gorgeous. This is so exciting. Here we go, we're coming in. There's Frances. Frances, you wanna say hi to the kids from Camp Hourhead? Hi, how are you everybody? So Francis is gonna help us out with Freddie. We'll see you soon, bye. Hi everybody. We are back at the rec department. We're gonna go see Andrea who has been willing to help Freddie with his makeover. And here we are. Hi everybody, I'm Andrea. We're here at the Natick Recreation and Parks Department. I've got Freddie here and a did you finish my coffee? <gasps> Freddie, oh. I didn't give him any today. I'm sorry, oh, Andrea. Well, I'll, I'll get you another my, one. I'll just drink my water. It's good, good to stay hydrated. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, for helping Freddie get his makeover. Yeah, no problem. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Can't wait to see how Freddie turns out. Flat Ferret went to visit Ethan's mom in Natick and had some snow adventures. Even though it is springtime in Natick, the snow fell one day and Flat Ferret played with his friend Snowy the Snowman in the garden. They made a special sign for the campers at Camp Arrowhead in honor of Ethan, who loved his time with all the campers, staff, and families. Flat Ferret wanted to continue his adventure, so he explored Ethan's family's backyard and went sledding and snowshoeing. Ethan's family sends lots of love to the Arrowhead campers, staff, and all the Recreation and Parks families. And a nice surprise is, Flat Ferret even went to see Ethan, finally, in St. Louis, Missouri. He says hi to all. Maybe we'll even see some pictures soon of Flat Ferret and Ethan in St. Louis. So last time uh, Flat Ferret and I were together, we were able to conquer the skies with a nicely made parachute. So we were kind of coming up with ideas, what can we do, what can we do? So we thought, if we already conquered the skies, let's go for the seas. So what we're going to try to do is make a boat that's able to withstand holding a lot of pennies. I'd like to show you guys the USS Arrowhead here. Uh, we have the mainsail right over here. 
That was Hannah driving her motorcycle past my house. Uh, there's the crow's nest up here, which is a little shaky, but I think it will hold. I shrunk down a flat ferret here with my strength ray so he'd be able to fit in the boat, and he's at the captain's home. So uh, let's set him to sea. He floats. <laughs> and I was thinking it over, if I was going to put pennies in, I don't think it would, it would sink because pennies are pretty light. So I gathered some rocks. And we're to see. We gotta test them. It's gotta get some, some rocks in here in case it wants to float on the main land. See, it's all about distribution now. He's gotta like lay the rocks out as they come. Oh, let's go a little big boy here in the middle. Oh, felt something on that one. The most important thing when putting on the rocks is trying to find that balance of like spreading out the rocks. That way, all the rocks don't uh stay on one side and capsize the boat too early. Oh, crow's nest might fall. Let's just put leave two rocks in that one. At this point, I was pretty impressed with the USS Arrowhead and how well it was doing. At this point, I was just putting on the bigger rocks just to see how long it would take to sink it. Oh, we're sinking! It's going in the corner. Ferret, get off, Ferret! Oh, I saved him! He's fine. Oh, my poor boat. The sail. <laughs> the crow's nest stayed up though. All right. I think that was still pretty successful. Uh, Flat Fair and I have now conquered both, uh, l not land. We still have to do land. That's coming up next. Uh, air and sea.